Welcome to today's lectures uh, on kernels for graphs. So what we're going to discuss today, after some motivating example, um, is the question of how we can do machine learning over data, which are graphs. First, uh, by representing each graph as a vector and using you know, linear models of our vectors, then discussing whether the kernels, kernel tree can, and kernel approaches can help uh, identify some fundamental challenges, even with kernels, and finally, propose a solution based on work, so it would be called work-based kernels for graphs, uh, before concluding with some applications. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do, basically, is to extend the, the tools we have seen so far, so the kernel methods, like kernel rich regression, or SVMs, or PCA, to data which are not vectors, but which are graphs. A typical application uh, use or use of this approach would be in chemistry, when you want to develop machine learning models to relate the structure of a molecule to some property of the molecule, like on this slide, if you want to predict if a molecule is active to uh, inhibit a protein of HIV, so a candidate drug for uh, AIDS, uh, then you see that you would like to solve a machine learning problem where the input X is a molecule, which um, on this figure looks like a graph. So it's a graph in a sense that uh, you have vertices which are atoms, and you have connections, so bounds, chemical bounds between atoms, which would be edges of the graph. And, and you would like to design a function that maps molecules to activity. Right? Uh, other applications or other examples, even though this, this picture is a bit old uh, in today's standard, uh, but there are applications in image, for example, or even in video, speech, etc., or texts, where you have a you know, an object, like in this case, an image, which is made of subparts. Um, and so there are many techniques to identify uh, subparts, which would be, for example, objects in an image. And then a graph may be a, a useful representation to uh, express the relative positions of different objects in the image, right? So I'm not talking of the image processing part, but just saying that sometimes we can represent the structure of a complex object like an image using a graph. And possibly, we may want to exploit this graph in order to do machine learning. So again, here, this will be the input. So one image gives one graph, and we want to relate this graph to something. So we need to run a function from the set of graphs to some output, which could be continuous or discrete. All right, so in order to, you know, to solve such problems, this means that we, we assume, you know, using our standard settings in this course, that we, we have a space of uh, an input space of data, which are graphs. So here are illustrated with some you know, visual graphs that look a bit like molecules. And what we'd like to do is to solve a regression or classification problem. That, and so the way we'll do that is basically using kernels or not by first representing each uh, graph as a vector in a Euclidean or Hilbert space. And so if we have a, a vector representation, remember that we can associate to it a kernel. So if we, if we call phi of x a vector representation of a graph uh, x, then we can associate naturally a kernel k of x, x prime between two graphs as the inner product between phi of x and phi of x prime. And if we do that, then we will be able to solve problems like uh, classification or regression or other problems using the theory of kernels, meaning using linear models in the Hilbert or Euclid space. All right. So this is what we will do. And what we, do, what we will discuss are basically either explicitly how to represent a graph as a vector, or implicitly how can we make kernels corresponding to particular embeddings of the set of graphs to some continuous Hilbert space. All right, so let's start by discussing um, how we can represent a graph as a vector. We will not talk about kernels for the next few minutes, but we will already see that there are some fundamental properties that we have to be careful about when we want to represent a graph as a vector. All right, so here we don't talk about kernel, I just repeat the same image. We just ask the question, um, can we just design a mapping phi from that transforms any graph x into, in this case, it would be a finite dimensional vector if you want to be able to store it, for example, and then use phi of x. You know, when we have a set of graphs, you obtain a data matrix where each graph is a vector, and then we can just use any method uh, 
for vector analysis in order to, to learn a model for, for graphs. All right, so first question is, what ideas can we have about phi and are there some specific constraints or problems we have to be careful about? I must say that you know this idea is, is in fact the most natural idea and it's widely used. Uh, for example, in the field of chemoinformatics, uh, it's still very common to use uh, ways to transform a molecule uh, into a vector, sometimes in that field we call that a fingerprint when it's binary. Uh, and a standard fingerprint, which you can guess from this image, is to start, you know, for any given molecule to identify the subparts, like the chemical subparts it contains, and to anchor the molecule as a binary fingerprint that just says which chemical subparts it contains. And then doing that over a large collection of molecules allows you to train uh, any model, like as to the SVM or nearest neighbors or um, or neural networks or PLS, as a tree, et cetera on this vector representation, right? So this is used, this is widely used. Now, the question is, um, how did we, uh, how, do, how can we decide, uh, you see on this picture, how can we decide the chemical structures or the subgraphs that we choose to, um, uh, to represent a molecule um, uh, as a vector? And so here there are, uh, you can feel that there are, two things that you may want to do one is to have as many substructures as possible in order to be very expressive you want to capture all the properties of your molecule with a big dictionary of basic uh, structures but on the other hand you you don't want to have too many of them because first it may be computationally you know intensive it may be computationally costly to compute the fingerprint if for example you need to compute a billion parameters it may take i don't know minutes hours days to compute that so you don't want that uh, and also related to computation, uh, maybe you don't want to store uh, two high dimensional vectors. Uh, it may also induce problems in, in statistics if you work in two high dimension, etc. So there is this trade off of uh, how to design an, a dictionary of structures to index your, your molecules that is large enough to be expressive, but not too large or not too complicated so that you can compute it explicitly and store it explicitly. All right, so um, in the case of molecules, as I said, uh, the standard uh, still still used nowadays in many companies and, and uh, research labs is to, is to start from chemical substructures. And so mathematically, this means that when we have a graph as input, we strike from it uh, what are the subgraphs uh, present in a graph, and we encode the presence or absence, or maybe the number sometimes of times the subgraph occurs in the molecule to form a graph. Um, right, so so it's used in chemistry in particular because in that field it's important. I mean, any chemist knows that many of the properties of, of the molecule can be guessed from the presence or absence of, of some molecule, of some uh, chemical parts. Like here, there is a benzenic cycle. We know it, it leads to specific properties of solubility, etc. Uh, and so it seems to be interesting. I mean. Let's try to discuss a bit this idea to say what about indexing, you know, following this trend and, and without being a chemist, trying to, to say, well, when we have a graph, let's index the graph by the subgraphs in contains. Right, so um, let's try to do that. So let's, you know, let's not talk about chemi uh, chemistry anymore for a moment, but just more mathematically and generally about when you have to manipulate graphs, uh, what would it be to index a graph by the subgraphs it contains? So for that, we need maybe to, to be a bit more clear about what we call the graph and a subgraph. Uh, a, a graph mathematically is just a pair of, uh, which we denote often by V and E. V is a set of vertices, so think of it as a finite set of, of things. And E is a set of edges, so we'll just focus on undirected graph, uh, even with no self loop. So E is just uh, a set of pairs uh, of vertices, which are not, uh, not direct. Okay. Um, in this course, we will discuss graphs which are labeled, meaning that uh, the vertices are not only uh, a set of finite objects, but we, there is possibly a labeling function that gives uh, a label to each of the vertices. So in chemistry, the label would be the type of atom, for example. Uh, and on this picture here, where you see a bunch of graphs, the labeling function is just a color. So here I use different colors, but it's, it's possible that two vertices have the same color, right? 
the color does not indicate what is the vertex, it indicates what is its product. So that's the notion of a graph. A graph is a pair VE. And then when we have a graph, we have a notion of subgraph. So a subgraph, uh, let's say, is is once you start from a graph, you obtain a subgraph by just taking a subset of the vertices uh, from the graph, okay? Uh, and then taking a subset of edges so that the edges you keep only connect the vertices you have chosen. Right? So it's quite intuitive in a sense picture if you start from this graph with four uh, four vertices, or a red, a blue, a yellow, and a green, then this is the list of all subgraphs. So you see that each subgraph is a graph in itself, and it has the property that it can be uh, recovered uh, you know, as a subset of the input graph by uh, taking a subset of the vertices and a subset of the, of the edges. For example, the last one, uh, the linear graph uh, that connects a red to a blue to a green to a yellow, is a subgraph of the input graph because you recover uh, the red connected to the blue, connected to the uh, green, connected to the yellow. You see there is one edge missing, so it's not the same graph. We say that the two graphs are not isomorphic, but it's a subgraph. So this corresponds really to the notion that uh, that I showed in the previous slide about chemical substructures, like is the benzene cycle a substructure of the molecule really means mathematically that we want to check if the graph of benzene is a subgraph or not of your molecule. All right. so. So this suggests that maybe one way to proceed and one way to solve these types of problems, uh, not only in chemistry, but in any field, is to say, when you have a graph, like here on the left, we have a graph A, A, B, A, B, with some edges uh, uh, among the, uh, the, the vertices, we may want to represent that graph as a big vector, uh, in this case, which is binary. But again, uh, we will see later that this you can either set a binary vector for the presence, absence, or counts the number of occurrences. But the important thing here is that each coordinate of that vector would be would correspond to a particular graph. And in this case, the one would say that this graph, so the graph corresponding to each coordinate, is a subgraph or not of the graph you want to index. So for example, you know, most of the coordinates would be zero because most of the graphs are not a subgraph of your input graph. But in that case, the graph A connected to A is a subgraph because you, you detect it in the input graph here. And the same for the triangle AAB, which is also a subgraph of your input graph. Right, so this is a candidate function phi that transforms a graph into a vector. And it seems promising, like this is more or less what's used in chemistry, and you can think of it as a very expressive and, and rich representation of a graph that could could be a good way to, to do machine learning, for example. All right, so, so today I'm going to announce a number of, let's say, bad news about things we cannot do. And it's interesting that this is a field where we can say a few negative uh, statements. Uh, and here is the first one. Uh, the first one is that if you, um, if you want to work with this representation, uh, then you will very quickly meet some computational problems because uh, we're going to show now that computing this vector representation, you know, even though it's it's I mean it's big, but it's not infinite because you know most of the coordinates would be zero after some points. So we say I, I just want to identify the ones. Well, identifying the ones in that vector uh, is a problem which is called NP-hard. NP-hard meaning that it's uh, at least as hard as what's called NP-complete problems, and for us. You know, in practice, it means that nowadays nobody on Earth uh, knows how to implement that with an algorithm that would run in polynomial time. Right? So basically, um, <clears throat> it will be very uh, long to compute. And and so when we, you know, very long means that maybe for small graphs you, you can implement it, but as soon as you have more than ten or fifteen or twenty nodes, then it may take years to compute these uh, these uh, these graphs. That is a feature representation. All right, so it, I mean, at first sight, it may look a bit uh, surprising because it doesn't seem that we want to do something super complicated. We just want to detect the extract the subgraphs, uh, but the, the, the still is complicated. And here is the proof. So this is, a, you know, maybe not all, all not all of you are familiar with these notions of uh, computational complexity. 
Uh, but basically, to prove that the problem is, is fundamentally complicated, the standard way uh, to prove it mathematically is to show that if you were able to compute the mapping phi of x, so if you are able to compute this binary vector, then from that, you would solve a problem that we know is hard. So, you know, NP-hard means that your at least as hard as a class of problems called NP-complete. And here we can show that if you are able to compute this vector, then you are able to solve a problem which is called finding a Hamiltonian path in a graph. And that problem is going to be hard. So what is a Hamiltonian path in a graph? Um, when you start from a graph, and let's assume for the moment that they, all the nodes, all the vertices have the same label. Let's forget about the A and the Bs and just look up as if everybody was A. So you have just the structure of a graph. Then the Hamiltonian path is just a path, meaning a sequence of vertices uh, that are connected by edges that goes exactly once through uh, each vertex. Right? So think of it as if the graph is a, you know, a, the, the, the map of the Paris subway, is it possible just to go to, through all the stations in the subway exactly once? Uh, and it turns out that solving that problem is complicated. Right. We don't know how to solve that. I mean, it's part of the algorithms, part of the problems for which we have, uh, we are not aware of any polynomial time algorithm that can solve it, except by enumerating all possible solutions and checking if one of them uh, exists. So this is this would be exponential time in the number of vertices. Right. Uh, by the way, this is, you know, maybe this reminds you of other problems. There is another related problem, which is finding a Eulerian path. Which, uh, which is not going through each CD or each station exactly once, but going over each bridge exactly once, if we call bridge what connects the two stations. And that problem is easy, right? You know how to solve it with the envelope uh, picture that uh, at school you may have played with. So here, the, the hard problem is Hamiltonian. It's NP-complete. And we notice, uh, you know, the link with the graph kernel, uh, with the graph representation we have here is that uh, suppose you start with this uh, with this graph. So here we have one, two, three, four, five vertices. Uh, let's assume that all vertices are A's to make this, the thing even more simple. Then think of what is the coordinate corresponding to the linear graph of five A's. So A, for example, here we have the connected graph with two A's. Uh, somewhere else we would have the connected graph with three A's, four A's, and five A's. Now, if we look at the one with five A's, you see that it should be zero or one, depending on whether the linear path with five A's is a subgraph of your input graph. And this is exactly saying, so uh, the fact that the linear path of five A's is a subgraph here, exactly means that there is a Hamiltonian path, right? So just computing one bit here, corresponding to the A, uh, so to five A's linearly connected, amounts to solving the Hamiltonian path problem. And as I said before, this is a problem for which we don't know uh, any polynomial time algorithm to solve. Right, so you have to think that, of course, here, if there are just five uh, vertices, um, you may want to enumerate all possible paths and check if they exist. So this is the, <coughs> the exponential solution. Uh, but think of it as if, you, if your graph is just a real molecule with 60 atoms, then this, this would be literally impossible to check whether or not there is a Hamilton in that. And maybe for molecule, you have other properties, like the degrees is uh, the degree of the vertices are small, et cetera. But on a generic graph with 50 nodes, it's just not possible to, to say whether or not there is a Hamilton in that. Right, so fundamentally, this representation may be very useful, expressive, interesting, but it's uh, not computational friendly, meaning you cannot implement it. You should not start a you know, startup company trying to develop a software to compute that. It will just not work. OK, so um, how do you solve the problem? Uh, one idea may be that maybe we are a bit too ambitious by indexing a graph by all the subgraphs. So we could say, let's remove from the list of all subgraphs most of them. And for example, just keep the linear ones. Right, so we this one is a triangle, it's complicated. So you see that if you do that, you drastically reduce the, dimen the dimension or the number of bits that would be non zero for a graph. Uh, 
uh, and so this this is you know for for this example uh, with colors this would mean that instead if i come back a bit earlier instead of enumerating all subgraphs including the triangles etc we would just uh, enumerate the ones with no cycle uh, but if you have followed the, the proof that uh, the previous one was um, np hard to compute then the same proof holds here right because the proof was based on on the fact that even a single bit corresponding to a linear uh, graph was np hard to compute right so it, it does not even help to drastically reduce the the space over which you index as long as you even keep the linear graphs it will be np hard so that's that's let's say negative like it's it's a bad news um, <clears throat> So of course, if you're pragmatic, you may say, well, you know, maybe this is a nice mathematical result, but maybe there are things we can do uh, if we're a bit careful and find a trade-off between how much time it takes to, to compute and, and the expressiveness. In fact, there's been plenty of research here. I just cite um, a few of them, but people have either used domain knowledge, so for example, in chemistry in particular, uh, most of the something called the MDL fingerprints, which is used by companies, you know, by pharmaceutical companies every day, uh, use um, a dictionary of subgraphs which is driven by chemical knowledge so they don't they don't say let's look at all the substructures they say well you know chemists know that this substructure is important that was important etc and then you can have specific algorithm to detect or not the presence of these substructures um, there are other tools used also in chemistry so one is, is sold by a company called OpenAI and it's quite famous as well uh, which looks at all the paths as we said, but limits the length, right? Because when I say it's, you know, the computation is NP hard to find a Hamiltonian path, the difficulty arises when you have uh, molecules that grow in size. Uh, but if you restrict, uh, you know, as soon as, for example, OpenAI, I think, uses lengths uh, of up to probably something like eight atoms. So when you restrict a uh, path to, uh, to length eight, then you don't really care. I mean, it's not too complicated, even if, if the molecule has size 50 atoms, you would just look for short path in them, right? So it's, it's doable and the complexity will be polynomial with degree K in that case. Uh, other people have, have looked at restricting the set of paths, so not enumerating all paths, but for example, only looking at shortest paths um, or moving to graphs, so again, limiting the size of the subgraphs or looking just at frequency. So there are, uh, and, and this is just a very short list of what people have thought. So, you know, when I uh, just want to mention that to say that it's not because it's NP hard that uh, people have not tried to uh, to find uh, um, um, practical solutions to still index multiple graphs as a vector of features using the concept of sub subgraphs. Um, let me mention so i i said for example one idea is to use, uh, to use just shortest path so here the idea is that you still look for linear path but you don't count how many times each uh, linear path occurs you just count how many times they occur among the shortest path and the shortest path is that is just you know you pick two vertices and you look at all the shortest path that connects them and so this means that for example the path a a b a will not be listed because it's never a shortest path. Because you see that uh, if you want to go from the second A to the last A, you should not go through the B if you want to be short. Right? So it's a way to reduce the number of paths you count. And you can show, this was shown by uh, Karsten Barwak and, and a colleague, uh, that because you, know, uh, you just have N square possible shortest path, so big O of N square, because it's all the pairs of vertices that lead to one or a few shortest paths. And it's possible to compute um, efficiently the vector of, of counts of all the, how many times each linear path is a shortest path in cubic time. Right? So this is one possibility to index a graph. Um, another one is just to restrict yourself to short graphs, and this is called, uh, uh, this is called the graphlet uh, representation. So again, this is obviously polynomial time. All right, so uh, summary of this first result. Um, what I said is that we would like, and you know, based and motivated by applications in chemistry, but not only, it seems that when you want to represent a graph as a vector, one interesting idea would be to extract the, the parts of the graph, so the subgraphs, uh, 
But there are some, some mathematical fundamental limits there, which is that extracting subgraphs is a complicated operation. Basically, if you want to count how many times or to identify the presence of a subgraph, we know uh, that there is no fast algorithm in most cases in the, in the general setting. All right, so let's move on now to coming back you know, to the notion of kernel and think a bit whether, uh, even though it's not possible to compute all these these vector representations, kernels could help. And what I mean by that is that we have seen, you know, in this course, many, many cases where uh, there was the kernel trick in the sense that you had a simple function, a k kernel between x and x prime, um, which is easy to compute and which corresponds to an inner product in a space where, you know, that corresponds to phi of x inner product phi of x prime, uh, where the phi are hard to compute, for example, because they are in finite dimension. All right, so there is this, this idea that maybe, uh, here I just said that computing phi of x is complicated. The question is, would it be easier to compute a kernel? Could kernels help in, the, in that domain? All right, so we'll start by saying that, uh, you know, again, setting a couple of negative results, showing that uh, kernels do not always help. And so what we want to do here, you know, again, is to say, um, instead of computing phi of x, can we, because we know that many algorithms can either use phi of x or can, can use the kernel, if we use a kernel method, um, what about looking at kernels for, for graphs? So let's, let's first discuss a very general result and, and question, which is that, you know, uh, what, what is the minimum thing you would like uh, from a kernel? So if we don't talk anymore about the phi, but about the kernels, which correspond to some phi and possibly to several phi, you see that, for example, one thing we would like uh, to, to, to make sure uh, is true is that uh, when you map different graphs, so here, for example, you have two blue graphs, you see they look like each other, but there is a small difference. Uh, then you would like these two graphs to be mapped to two different points, right? If this, this happens, this is called uh, a complete kernel. People uh, call that complete kernel. So a complete graph kernel is just a kernel such that when you have two different graphs, their distance in the feature space is non-zero. Um, a small word of caution here, you know, on the picture, you just see these two, two drawings of two graphs, and I say they look like each other, but they are different, So the, because you cannot su superimpose them. In mathematics, this is called isomorphism between graphs. And, and the, you know, we just don't say that the graphs are equal or not. We say they are isomorphic, just because remember that the graph mathematically is a pair VE, so a list of vertices and a list of edges. And so uh, if you have, you know, the same graph structure uh, twice, but with the list of vertices in different orders, then the V between the two representations will be different and the set of edges will be different as well. So they, they would be, uh, they would represent the same object, but up to a bijection between the list of vertices that conserve the edges, right? So this is why uh, in, in graph theory, we talk of isomorphic graphs to say that, you know, maybe the same picture can be represented by two pairs VE. And so what we would like here is that, of course, if you have two isomorphic graphs, they should be mapped to the same point. But if you have two non-isomorphic graphs, we would like them at minimum to be mapped to different points. Right. Uh, so why, you know, I said we would like uh, to have this achieved. Why do we want this to be achieved? Well, one of the reasons is that if this is not the case, so if we have a kernel such that there exist non-isomorphic graphs or different graphs which are mapped to the same point in the future space, then there will be some fundamental limit in what we can learn, right? Because if we want to learn a function, for example, that predicts the activity of a molecule uh, in the future space. Uh, and if the you know two molecules uh, have different activities, then uh, we will ne never be able to model different activities if the two molecules are the same point, right? Because the function will map the point to some activity prediction. So it seems to be like a, a minimum uh, a minimum feature we would like to have. Um, so first question is: Is it at all possible to to make sure that any kernel we not even talk of phi, you know, if we are able to compute a kernel? Is it possible to show that, uh, to make sure that any kernel is uh, as this product? Um, and unfortunately, the, the answer is um, basically uh, you will pay a price. So if you are able to compute 
you know, to, to, to decide and, and implement a graph kernel, which is complete, meaning that it separates non isomorphic graphs or whatever the, the space is, just making sure that different graphs are mapped to different points. Then if you are able to do that, uh, then you solve a problem which is hard. And so computing any complete graph kernel is at least as hard as solving a problem called the graph isomorphism problem, um, which is just a question of if I give you two two graphs, so again, mathematically uh, or in computer, uh, computer science, a graph is a set of two, two files, so you have V and E, so a list of vertices uh, and a list of edges between vertices. If I give you V1, E1, and V2, E2, the graph isomorphism problem is just a question of whether or not this is the same graph. Meaning, is it possible to reorder the, the vertices in V2 so that the matrix, uh, so the, the, the edges among the, the vertices of V2 exactly match the vertices in V1? Right? And it turns out that uh, this problem is hard. So, uh, as far as I know, this is a problem where we are not sure if it's NP hard. Uh, people believe it's not NP hard, but almost NP hard. But what, what I know is that. Uh, Nowadays, uh, nobody knows any uh, polynomial time algorithm to solve that problem. And so the best you can do is basically to try all possible permutations. So when you have two graphs, the best you can do, so if they have the same size, of course, is to try all possible permutations of the vertices of the second graph and check if the, if the edges correspond to the edges of the first graph. Right? And so this is exponential complexity. All right, so, so this theorem is, is, in fact, easy to prove because uh, it relies on the fact that if you are able to compute a kernel between two graphs, then you are able, remember, to compute their distance in the feature space because um, the distance, uh, the square distance between G1 and G2 in the feature space is just a, a sum of three kernel evaluations. So it's the kernel between G1 and G1 plus the kernel between G2 and G2 minus twice the kernel between G1 and G2. Right, so if you have implemented, if you have a software that computes the kernel between G1, G1, G2, G2, and G1, G2, then you just call your function three times, you make this sum, and you get a number. Uh, and if the, the, your, your kernel is complete, then this number is zero if and only if graphs G1 and G2 are the same. Right, so this means that computing the kernel allows you to solve the question, the graph isomorphism problem. And so, as I said, nowadays, uh, nobody knows any polynomial time algorithm to solve that. And many people believe that there exists no polynomial time algorithm to do that. So this implies that computing your kernel cannot be polynomial time, right? At least if it's true that the graph isomorphism is, is hard. All right, so this is a kind of very uh, negative results, meaning that anytime you will see a graph kernel or, you know, even uh, even if it's not a kernel, even a graph representation, so graph neural networks, for example, they also map graphs to vectors. Uh, if you have an operation that is implemented in polynomial time, you know that it will never be uh, complete, uh, meaning that there will always be graphs that are mapped to the same point, but which are different. Right? So it's a kind of bad news uh, when we want to do machine learning on, on, on graphs, even though in practice, you know, it may be the case that the different graphs which are mapped to the same point may be large or maybe not relevant. I mean, it's, it doesn't mean that it's fundamentally bad for all applications, but it's good to have in mind that, um, uh, you know, machine learning graphs has fundamental difficulties. And in particular, it's not, uh, you will never find any fast algorithm to represent a graph either as a vector or through a kernel that separates uh, exactly non-isomorphic graphs. All right, so what else can we say? Uh, another question, uh, so the, the, you know, we, we already have a negative results even for kernels. Another question is if we come back to this idea of indexing a graph by the subgraphs it contains, uh, remember that we said that computing phi of x for this particular mapping phi, so that indexes a graph by how many times or yes or no it contains a subgraph, we said that this was uh, NP complete. Right, so it's even more complicated than the graph isomorphism problem. Uh, we said that because it solved the, the Hamiltonian path problem. 
So here we may wonder whether there could be a kernel trick, meaning that, you know, if we say, well, instead of computing this vector, we're not really interested in the vector. What we're interested in is uh, the inner product, meaning the, the kernel between two graphs. And the question is, you know, maybe it's less complicated to uh, to compute the kernel than comp computing phi. So, for example, the proof that phi was complicated was that because one bit corresponding to the Hamiltonian path was hard to compute. In fact, we don't really care about that bit. What we care about is the inner product, and maybe. Uh, at least a question that we'll answer soon. Uh, maybe it could be possible to do this inner product. So given two graphs, think that each of them has a, has a mapping phi. And what we care about is just the inner product between the, the vector of phi of G1 and phi of G2, uh, if we if we have two, two graphs, G1 and G2. Right, so, so we define formally a subgraph kernel here uh, between two graphs as the inner product between the, the corresponding phi's. And so because each phi is a vector indexed by uh, graphs, right? So each coordinate is indexed by a graph. And in this case, it is binary. Or here we just count how many times each graph is a subgraph. Uh, we end up with the fact that the inner product itself would be a sum over all graphs h of, for example, the number of times h is a subgraph of g1 times the number of times h is a subgraph of g2, potentially times a, a weight lambda h a non-negative weight to make sure this is an inner product. All right, so question is, um, can we say anything about the complexity of computing k subgraph? And is it the same, for example, as computing uh, phi, which we know is NP-hard? And the answer was, again, proved by Thomas Gertner and colleagues in, in 2003. Uh, and is uh, negative in the sense uh, that kernel does not help here. And, and, and the statement is that computing the subgraph kernel that I just showed is NP-hard. So it's the same complexity, uh, it's the same class of complexity as computing phi of x. So there is no kernel trick that works here. It's not easier to compute the inner product than to compute the facts. Um, let's prove that. So the proof, uh, the proof is based on, on the similar idea. Remember that the proof that computing phi was hard was just that computing one particular uh, entry of phi was hard is because it solved the Hamiltonian path problem. Uh, and here, what we're going to show is that if, if we don't compute phi, but if we are able to compute kernels, then we can also extract from the kernel uh, this particular bit, which solves the Hamiltonian path problem. And so the, the, the structure of the proof is to show, uh, is to try to think how we can, if I come back to the, the plot here, how we can compute the value of, of these, you know, one of the bits here corresponding to the to the Hamiltonian path problem, if we don't compute the full vector, but if we just compute pairwise inner products, right? So kernels. So to do that, what we will do is uh, so to prove that we can solve the Hamiltonian path problem from the kernel. Uh, let's let's proceed as follows. Let's let's consider, you know, the set. Uh, so let's call Pn the, the graph, which is the linear graph with n vertices. So for example, on this plot here, you see, uh, so we would assume, by the way, that all, we will not care about the label. So let's do as if all the labels will be all A's. And of course, the proof will also work uh, if you have different labels. But if we just have all the times all the labels, then you see that all the graphs that will index uh, the input graph will all have the same label. So we just care about the structure. And so among all the indexes, we will look at the indexes corresponding to linear graphs. So here we have AA, which is P2. So P2 is the graph with uh, two connected nodes. Somewhere else, you have P3, which would be three connected nodes linearly, P4, P5, etc. And again, the, the crucial one in this case would be P5, meaning that if we can compute the bit corresponding to P5, uh, then we solve the Hamiltonian path problem. So let's call Pn the, the path with uh, the linear path with n vertices. Uh, and, and, and let's observe that you know uh, the when we look at phi of Pn, so here now we see Pn not only as a coordinate of the vector, but also as a graph for which we can compute phi. So in as, as an input graph, we can take the linear the linear graph and, and ask 
what is the phi of this graph? So what is the vector corresponding to Pn, for example, to P5 or to P4? And so this raises the question of what are the subgraphs of Pn? Because remember that to index a graph, you need to extract all the subgraphs. So what, what are the subgraphs of, of P5, for example? So the linear graph with, with five vertices. Then it's easy to see that the only uh, connected subgraphs are also linear, uh, linear graphs. Like if you have P5, so if you have A connected to A connected to A and these five times, then when you want to extract a subgraph, you can extract individual nodes. So these are P1 and you have five times of it. Then you can extract A connected to A and there are four possibilities for that. So you have four times the graph uh, P2. Then you have A connected to A connected to A and there are three ways to, to extract it. So you have three times uh, P3, etc. And so more generally, the representation of Pn uh, is exactly equal to here, uh, you know, to a vector uh, which has n to the coordinate corresponding to p1, n minus 1 to the coordinate corresponding to p2, etc., and 1 corresponding to the coordinate of pn itself. Right? So here I use the notation epn just to uh, represent uh, the, 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 the basis, uh, you know, the, the basis vector corresponding to each graph. All right, so this is um, okay. Uh, this is a property, but the, the the reason why we write this is that once you write this, uh, you know, this equality for P one, then for P two, then for for P three, uh, etc., up to P five, for example, then you will get a series of equality that gives you phi of P n as a function of E P n. Um, and if if you write it in a matrix form, for example, you see that the matrix can be inverted because the matrix will be um, basically diagonal, uh, sorry, triangular uh, with non-zero entries on the diagonal. So you can reverse the system. And based on, the, on, on these equations, you can express the, 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 the basis vector corresponding to Pn as a linear combination of the phi of Pi, where i is uh, between 1 and n, with some weights alpha i's, which I don't write here explicitly, but which are just obtained by solving, you know, inverting this system. Right here, you have a system that gives you phi of Pn as a function of Epi's. And if you inverse the system, you can express Epn as a function of phi of Pi's. And these and the, the alphas can be obtained in polynomial time. All right, so this is crucial because now this tells us that, you know, remember I said that the, the NP hardness of phi comes from the, being able to compute a single bit which was a p5 for the for the graph of size 5 to check if there is a Hamiltonian path and so this equation allows us to write ep5 for example as a linear combination of the phi of pi for i equal 1 to 5. and so now uh, using the you know the, the property that the kernel is a linear product uh, we may say that computing uh, if you have a graph g of size n which would be size 5 in my example if you want to compute the bit corresponding to the linear, so to P5, that would be the one that solves the Hamiltonian pass. What you need to do is to just to make the inner product, to compute the inner product between phi of G, which is this big vector, and EPN, which is just the basic vector corresponding to the, to the index P, Pn. Okay, this is what we want to compute. And then we want to check if it's zero or one, basically. And now, because we're able to express Pn as a function of phi of Pi, we see that we, what we need to compute is phi of G, inner product, the sum of alpha i phi of Pi. And here, we recognize that we can develop that, factorize phi transpose phi within the kernel, and obtain a formula that gives us that in order to determine whether or not there is a Hamiltonian path, we just need to compute the sum of alpha i k of G Pi, uh, so, you know, if you can compute that to obtain a number, and so if that number is strictly positive, this means that uh, the graph G has a Hamiltonian path. Oof. So this shows that, you know, if you are able to compute the subgraph kernel efficiently, then you are able to compute this number efficiently, and you're able to say efficiently if there is a Hamiltonian path. And by efficiently, I mean that uh, you know, some complexity, but because we know that the Hamiltonian path is NP complete, this means that computing your kernel cannot be more efficient, cannot be faster than the class of NP, NP 
complete problems, meaning that uh, completing the canon must be at least as hard as NP-complete problems, and this is what we call NP-hard problem. Right, so, um, you know, I went through the proof a bit slowly, but you see that uh, using the canon tricks, uh, we see that there is no benefit uh, in replacing phi into k in terms of complexity, meaning that once you have k, you can access the coordinates of phi in polynomial time, and therefore, if any of the coordinates of phi is fundamentally hard to compute, then computing the kernel must be at least as hard. So there is no trick, there is no gain in doing the inner product here. All right, uh, maybe I'll keep that. You know, we just like before we say maybe we are a bit too ambitious by looking at all the subgraphs, and we should look just at linear subgraphs, but as you have seen from the proof, it's not easier to restrict ourselves to linear subgraphs because the proof of the complexity was just uh, just involved in our subgraphs. All right, so summary so far, you know, we first we focused on whether or not it's possible to compute phi of g, where we want to index a graph by its subgraphs, and we, we said that it seems to be interesting, but it's hard. Uh, and then now we move to the to the kernels and said, is it possible to have some kernel tricks? And we just got two negative results. One is a very general negative result that says that you will never, either through phi or through a kernel, be able to compute a, a complete representation, meaning that a representation that, that maps non-isomorphic graphs to different points. This is fundamentally hard. And, and the second is that when we focus on the on the subgraph uh, representation, so uh, you have a graph represented by a vector that counts or that identifies the subgraphs, then not only is this vector NP hard to compute, but the corresponding kernel is NP hard as well. Right? There is no benefit in moving from the phi to the kernel. Tree. There is no kernel. Tree. All right. So um, after all these. Bad news. Let's turn to more positive news. And you know, researchers have thought um, have thought hard to try to bypass uh, the, the fundamental complexities. And maybe the what we will discuss now is one idea which which is quite uh, interesting, which looks a bit uh, like what we've done so far, but with one relaxation. And we will see that suddenly, in terms of complexity, we move from NP hard problems to just cubic problems, or problems we can solve very efficiently. I mean, uh, problems or kernels we can compute efficiently. And so the trick we will use is to replace the notion of path by the notion of a walk. What is that? Uh, remember that the path was a subgraph, right? So, so we started with all the subgraphs. Then we said, if we just look at linear subgraphs, we call them path. Um, and here, what we will do is, is a relaxation where we'll basically we will relax the assumption that uh, that uh, that a path uh, should go through each vertex only once right and so the notion of a walk is maybe a way, a way to describe it is if you have a graph like uh, our input graph here um, a walk would be just uh, from you know as the name suggests would be a way to start somewhere in the graph for example starting from the blue node here and moving from you know sequentially from uh, the node you are in to a neighbor. So for example, from the blue, you can move to the yellow, and then you can move to the green. Um, and if it was, you know, if you wanted to extract the path, then you would be stuck here because you cannot come back to the blue because the, the you know, the graph blue, yellow, green, blue is not a subgraph of that, right? For subgraphs, you need to, to have individual, individual vertices should be mapped to individual vertices. The relaxation we do in a walk is that we allow uh, the, the walk to come back to the blue node if, if we want, right? So for example, we could walk blue, yellow, green, blue, um, and then maybe yellow again or red again, and we will call the resulting linear graph a walk of the input graph. So for example, here, you know, from this input graph, here I list all the graphs which are walks. And for example, if I, you know, if I take the last one here, we see that this is uh, the linear graph that is blue, red, blue, green. So it corresponds to the walk blue, moving to red, moving back to blue, moving to green. Okay. So this linear graph blue, red, blue, green is not a subgraph, 
in, in, in terms of, of uh, what we define as a subgraph, so it's not a path, but it's a walk, right? So in a sense, there are many more walks than paths. And in particular, you see that uh, there are graphs of very long, uh, there are linear, linear graphs which are very long, which can be walked. For example, if you just alternate between red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, and you do that a thousand times, then you obtain that the graph red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, which has length a thousand, um, is a walk of the input graph. Right? So there are many, many walks uh, uh, from the graph. Right? So again, uh, walks, the, the concept of a walk is different from the concept of the path, uh, just basically because a path cannot come back to a, to a place it has visited before, whereas for a walk, we can circle, we can come back, and we can have very long. All right, so so question is, uh, would it make sense, you know, when you have a graph, for example, to extract all the walks? Uh, maybe we need to weight them because, as you know, as we said, there are basically an infinite number of walks. So which, if you just list, if you just list all the walks, then you you will get you know, many many things, and and uh, in particular, if you count them, you will get infinite numbers, etc. Um, so we need to have some weights here. And so here we can propose to say that if you have a graph G. Then what about encoding uh, g as a vector, phi of g, which, as before, is a vector indexed by linear graphs? Uh, but contrary to before, so when, when you look at the coordinate phi s of g, where s is, is a linear uh, graph, instead of counting uh, how many times s is a subgraph of g, and this is what we did before, and you said this is basically np hard. Here, what we will do is to check if S is a walk of G. So, you know, just like here, we say that green, yellow, green is a walk of this graph. So, this will be a positive. And in addition, probably we will uh, decide of, of, of some weight, which we call lambda G uh, of W, uh, just again, because if, you know, if we just, for example, had one or zero, depending on whether or not S is a walk of G. Then phi of g would have an infinite number of walks, so it would not be a vector. Uh, it would not define a Hilbert space, for example. Right. So we need somehow to to make sure that we have some weights that will probably go to zero when the length of the walk uh, go, of the walk goes to zero, in order to make sure that this defines a vector which is in L two. Right. So this is a candidate mapping. Right. So this is again a mapping indexed by a linear path, but the meaning of the value you get in phi is not the presence of a path, it's more the weight uh, of, of a walk. Uh, and of course, if once we have uh, this definition, we can uh, associate with a, a kernel, which we will call the walk kernel, which is just the inner product in that space. So it's again a sum over S, which are all the linear graphs of phi S of G1 times phi S of G2, uh, where phi S of G is related to how many times and with what weight S is a walk of G. All right, so uh, let me mention uh, um, three examples of uh, walk kernels that only differ by how they uh, define the weights. Because again, the weights is important here, just at minimum to make sure that phi of G is in L2, because we know there will be an infinite number of walks which are present, so we need to weight them. Uh, one, the simplest maybe is not to not to consider all the walks, but to restrict ourselves to walks which have a fixed length. So, for example, if I come back to my uh, this description, if we fix n equal three, this would mean that we just index the graph by all the linear paths of length three. So this would be the ones which are yellow, green, blue, or red, blue, uh, green, red, blue, yellow, etc. So all the ones of length three, you, you see there, there is a finite number of them. Uh, and, and, and just put zero to all the other ones, right? So with our notation, this means that we, we would set uh, the weight of a walk to one if the length is n. So this will count how many times the walk is present uh, in the graph, and zero other ones. Right, so maybe it's not very ambitious, which well, is not the most interesting kernel, but this is a particular kernel that basically counts uh, all the walks of length n in the graph and accumulate how many times they, they occur. Like there could be in a graph, you know, the, the walk uh, blue, red, blue, uh, 
you count how many times you see it in a graph. This would be one, one of the features. Uh, so when you do that, you see that uh, in terms of kernels, what's the meaning of computing the kernel between G1 and G2? Uh, basically, you you compare them in terms of how many how many common walks they have of length n. Right? How, if you have two kernels, you check to be similar in the feature space, they need to, to share uh, walks of length n. It's quite obvious. All right, uh, second, second ID uh, is a bit more interesting because here we allow some infinite number uh, of, of walks with non zero weights. So now phi of g becomes infinite uh, dimensional. Uh, the, so the second idea is to, to use what's called a random walk kernel, where basically we define the weight of a, of a walk as a probability of that walk. And so we need to define a probabilistic model that depends on a graph. And the most obvious probabilistic model for walk is to do a random walk on a graph. Right, so what is a random walk? If I come back to my example, a random walk is a probability distribution over all, you know, all these walks that is defined very naturally as follows. First, we define the probability to start the walk somewhere. So we need the probability of, over the vertices. For example, it could be uniform. Like here, you have four vertices. So you say the probability to start at any of the vertices is one fourth, 0.25. <clears throat> and then you, you sample or you generate a walk by saying uh, just with a Markov process or so a Markov walk over the graph, meaning that iteratively, if you are at a walk, uh, sorry, if you are at a given vertex, then you will move to a neighbor uh, with a, some probability. So you need a transition probability from any vertex to its neighbors, which also could be uniform. So for example, if you're in the blue, you could say with probably one third, I move to the yellow, or I move to the green, or I move to the red. Uh, and, and of course, you also need to say when you stop the walk, so you could stop it at fixed length, or you could say, you know, with probability, I stop the walk, so probability Point one, I stop the walk, and with priority point nine, I continue. So if you if you imagine this process, then uh, and, and if you sample it, then you will sample all you know all these walks, and if you sample them many times, each of them will come with some frequency, and the frequency in fact is a probability. So you can define the probability of each of these um, of these patterns of of these graphs as the probability that a random walk generates. It. Right, so you see, this is a way to give a weight to each uh, of the walks that depends on the graph. And these weights have the property that the sum of the weights over all the walks uh, is equal to one, because the total probability will be uh, one. So in particular, the sum of the weights squared uh, is finite, right? And so this is a way to create a phi of G, which is in L2. Uh, so it will be infinite dimensional, but the probabilities go to zero, and and uh, the sum of the squared coordinates will be finite. Right. So so this is what we call the random walk kernel. So the definition again is you define uh, this mapping phi of g, and the weight uh, that you give to a walk is its probability. And so if you think in terms now of what is the corresponding kernel, so remember that the kernel between two graphs is the inner product between phi of g and phi of g one. So it's the sum of all the possible walks of the probability of the walk in G1 multiplied by the probability of the walk in G2. And so this, you can reinterpret it. Uh, you know, the product of the probability is like the probability of an event if the two events are independent from each other. So the interpretation of the kernel in that case is that the kernel between two graphs is the probability that when you generate two random walks independently on the two graphs, they they generate the same sequence of colors. Okay, so it's a probability that the label, meaning the sequence of colors of walk one, is equal to the label of walk two. This is just an interpretation of the kernel in terms of probability. All right, so so quickly, let me mention that another uh, another way to give a weight for which you are sure that uh, it, you know the, the 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 phi of g is in L two. Uh, it's something called a geometric walk kernel. So it's it's a bit different. It's related, but slightly different from the random walk. Here, you don't really design um, a random walk process. Uh, you just say that you will enumerate all, sorry, I come back to the illustration. You would enumerate all the walks that, that are present. Uh, of course, you count them uh, as many times as, as you see them. 
and you just weight them with uh, a weight that decreases uh, exponentially with the length of the wall. Okay, so uh, you define uh, lambda g as some parameter beta, strictly positive, to the power of the length, meaning that you know when the length gets large, the weights get small. And so you can then the question is what, what you know how do you choose beta? So beta is a parameter. You see that if beta is small, then the long walks are heavily penalized. They don't contribute much to the vector. And if beta gets larger, then you allow longer walks to contribute to the to the vector. You know, they have bigger weights. Uh, but of course, there is a limit. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's easy to check uh, that uh, uh, there is a maximum beta you can take for any graph to make sure that the uh, that the you know the set of weights uh, decreases uh, is in L two, meaning the sum of the squares of the weights is in L two. Right. So, so it's a bit technical, but uh, if you over a class of graph, if you choose beta not too large, then you are sure that all the phi of, of g would be naked. All right, so these are three examples uh, you know, that, that borrow the same conceptual idea, which is to represent a graph as a vector indexed by the walks. And they just differ by how the, the weight of a coordinate is, is given. So what is the weight of a walk in a graph? OK, so now the question is, you know, these are all definitions, but again, if we cannot compute it, then it's not very interesting. So the question is, can we compute that? Is, is, is there any way to, to, to compute that? And in particular, you see that, again, we have infinite dimensional uh, vectors, except for the first one, but for the random walk and geometric walk kernel, phi of g is still an infinite vector. So we just cannot compute it. We cannot compute the property of all the walks, including the one of length billions, right? So here comes the good news of the day. I think this is the positive side of the day. Uh, there were many negative, I mean, useful, but practically negative results. Now, this one is positive. Uh, it tells us that even though phi of g is infinite dimensional and there is no way you can compute it or store it, uh, the kernels and the three kernels in particular that we discussed can be computed efficiently. Uh, and efficiently means, in this case, in polynomial time, and you know we will describe a bit more detail. The polynomial is, is we know what it is. It's basically uh, n to the six. Or it could be done a bit faster, right? So it's possible to implement it, and it's used, right? So it's not it's not just an abstract result for all these uh, uh, random walk and geometric walk kernel. Then we can compute quite efficiently, at least for small graphs, uh, the, the the kernels, even though the the mapping is infinite dimensional. Right, so this is really a kernel trick, and you see uh, there are two interesting things. One, which I just said, is that even though phi of g cannot be computed, the kernel can be computed. Right, so it's, it's basically a bit like the Gaussian kernel. It's easy to compute, but the the, the feature space of the Gaussian kernel is infinite dimensional, so you cannot compute the phi of phi of x, but you can compute k of x x prime for the Gaussian kernel. Here, it's a bit the same. And the second interesting property is that uh, you see that we had all these negative results for the path kernels. So if you if you represent a graph by all the paths it contains, uh, then it's NP hard. But here, by just replacing the notion of path by the notion of walk, suddenly uh, we change the space of complexity and we can compute efficiently the inner product. So there is a fundamental uh, difference between path and, and, and graphs. Uh, of course, if you follow the, 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 you know, what I said before, remember that we said that um, basically uh, there is no polynomial time kernel that is complete. And so here, because we have three kernels which are polynomial time, meaning we can use them, uh, of course, they are not complete. And I leave it to you to think a bit about uh, what, you know, what are the counterexamples. So what, what would be isomorphic graphs, like two graphs which are the same, uh, sorry, two graphs which are different, but which are mapped to the same uh, feature vector uh, with this uh, with this representation. Right? It has to exist because we have these uh, generic results that if you're polynomial time, then you cannot be complete. So these three kernels are not complete. But you know, I leave it to you to think about uh, examples of non-isomorphic graphs which are mapped to the same point. 
All right, so let's try, you know, to clarify where these positive results come comes from and, and, and how you would implement, for example, the, the random walk camera. Um, in fact, the proof is quite uh, interesting, quite um, uh, easy, but, but cute, I would say. Uh, it's based on a concept of a product draft, right? So, so there's a big definition here, but let's look maybe at the picture that, that uh, illustrates the definition. So it's a definition. Uh, it's given any two graphs. So here I take graphs G1 and G2. You see, I, I so I have numbers uh, or letters to identify which, verti which vertices are in G1 and G2. And you see also they have colors, OK? Which is a label. Now, given G1 and G2, we can, we can create a new graph, which is called the product graph, and which is called G1 times G2, which is plotted on the right here. Uh, which is just obtained as follows. Uh, to obtain, so it's a graph. So what I need to, to define is what are the vertices of the product graph and what are the edges of the product graph. So first, the vertices. The vertices of the product graph are simply vertices obtained by picking one vertex of G1 with one vertex of G2 with the same color, right? So for example, you see uh, for the yellow, um, uh, yellow nodes, you have two yellow vertices in G1, which are the vertices 1 and 2. You have three yellow vertices in G2, which are uh, uh, A, B, and D. And so from these two and three vertices, you can create 2 times 3 equals 6 pairs of vertices, uh, which have the same color. And so the, the pairs are 1A, 1B, 1D, 2A, 2B, 2D. And so this is what we plot on the right. These are the new vertices of the product graph. You have all of them. You do the same for the blue nodes. So you have two blue and two blue. So you can create four new blue nodes in the in the product graph. So these are the vertices. Now, what about the edges? Well, the definition of edges is quite natural. It just tells you that you put an edge between two vertices in the product graph if and only if there is an edge both in G1 and in G2 for the vertices uh, that created the, the new vertices. Right? So for example, if you look at, at the, the vertex 1B and the vertex 2A, uh, when you map them back to G1, you see that they correspond to the vertices 1 and 2, and there is an edge between 1 and 2. Similarly, on G2, you have B and A, so you see there is an edge between B and A. So this means that you should put an edge between 1B and 2A. Right? Uh, now you see that if you look at 2A and 1D, so between 1 and 2, there is an edge. So maybe you should put an edge. But between A and D, there is no edge in G2. So you don't put an edge between 2A and 1. And so if you do that systematically for all, you know, all vertices and all pairs of vertices in G1 times G2, you obtain a new graph, which is a graph with, you know, with a bit more nodes and, and, and vertices. Uh, so a bit more vertices and, and edges, which is the product graph. So notice that you know this is easy to implement. Like if I give you uh, two files, which are the description of, of G1, so meaning a list of four nodes with their colors and the list of edges, the same for G2, then uh, you can create a function in Python or C++ or whatever uh, that creates this quite easily. The complexity would be the size of G1 times the size of G2. All right, so why um, what's the link between um, this notion of product graph and our problem, which was to compute efficiently the graph kernel. Um, there are, so there are two, you know, two important ideas to compute efficiently the, the kernel. The first one is, is that, um, is this lemma, that there is a bijection between, on the one hand, pairs of walks, which are in G1 and G2, and which are the same labels, and on the other hand, individual walks on the product graph. Uh, maybe I will just illustrate it here. So what we said is that if you take a walk in G1 and a walk in G2, which are the same colors, then you can associate to them a, a unique walk in G1 times G2. And the association is quite trivial. It's just by uh, you know, taking the vertices uh, by, uh, in G1 times G2 obtained by matching the, the sequence of vertices in the walks. Uh, let's take an example. If you take the walk one, two, three, 
This is a walk in G1, which has color yellow, yellow, blue. So try to find another walk in G2, which is also yellow, yellow, blue. You see there is a single one, which is A, B, C. So what we claim is that now you have a pair W1, which is 1, 2, 3, and W2, which is A, B, C. And from this pair, W1, W2, you can create a walk in the product graph just by taking, uh, you know, aligning the two walks and considering the, the vertices 1A, 2B, 3C. And so 1A, 2B, 3C is a walk in the product graph, which is of color yellow, yellow, blue. Right, so this shows you how for each pair of work, you can create a single work in G1 times G2. And conversely, if you take a single work in G1 times G2, for example, let me take the work 4C2D4E. You see this is a work in G1 times G2, which has color blue, yellow, blue. Then we claim that uh, you can create, uh, so this work corresponds to a pair of works in G1 and in G2 with colors blue, yellow, blue. And, and how do you get this work? Well, you just restrict, you know, to get the work in G1, you just look at the first index uh, in the red C. So this would be 4, 2, 4. So 4, 2, 4 is a work in G1 with colors blue, yellow, blue. And if you take the second part of, of the name of the red C's, it's C, D, E. So C, D, E is a work in G2, which is blue, yellow, blue. Right, so you, you already have a bijection between individual walks in G1 times G2 and pairs of walks in G1 and in G2. And so this is useful uh, in the context of, of our work kernel because remember that uh, the definition of a work kernel was uh, an inner product between phi of G1 and phi of G2. The inner product itself was the sum over all the uh, you know, walks um, uh, of how many times they occur in G1 and how many times they occur in G2, and by how many times I mean the, the weight lambda G1 and lambda G2. And so this can be really written as the sum over all pairs of works, so all works in G1 and all works in G2, of the weight of, of the work in G1 times the weight of the work in G2 times an indicator function of whether or not they have the same label. Right. Here we just say um, the, the inner product is could be done by listing independently all the works in G1, all the works in G2, and just keeping the ones with the same labels to, to obtain this sum. And here, be, between the second line and the third line, uh, to obtain this, the last equation, we use the bijection that we just highlighted to say that all the pairs of works with the same label are uh, can be uh, are in digestion, so can be listed as well as the single walks of so the w in the product graph and then we uh, you know if we define lambda g1 uh, g2 of w as the product of the of lambda g1 of w1 and lambda g2 of w2 what we end up with is that we are able to rewrite the graph kernel simply as a sum over all the walks in the product graph of something Right, so the, the change we have done is that instead of having, uh, you know, a, an inner product or a sum over pairs of works, like what is the property that you know for the probability kernel, we said that the kernel is the property that two independent works have the same label. So this suggests we sample independently two works. Now what we have done is that we have rewritten this over just works over a bigger graph, which is a product graph. So that's the first. Uh, First trick, I mean, first uh, technical uh, progress we, we've made uh, to, to re express the, the graph uh, kernel. Uh, and the second thing is to show that, in, I mean, this, this may look a bit complicated because we still have to enumerate all the works in the product graph, right? And as, you know, not only is the graph bigger, but as, as we said before, there are plenty of works, uh, in particular, the, you know, the work yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, a billion times is a work. So, even here, it may not be completely clear what we gain because we still have uh, a sum of our potentially a billion, um, a billion terms, or I mean, an infinite number of terms. All right. So here, here comes the second trick, uh, which is uh, which is um, uh, related, for example, to the um, to the exponential uh, to the Gaussian kernel. We will see why. 
uh, is that it, it in some cases so in particular for the three can also for the three sets of ways we we, um, we have considered uh, it's possible to efficiently compute the sum over the, the weights of the product graph so let's start for example with the the less interesting uh, but maybe uh, simpler work kernel of order n and remember that one just uh, focused on works of length n so if we come back to this definition this means that the lambda of w is one if and only if the length of w is equal to one and so this translates over the product graph uh, to the same property meaning that what we want to compute is the sum of all the works in the product graph uh, which have length n right and so this this just means that the, the corresponding kernel would be the number of walks of length n in the product graph. So that's a question. How do we compute the number of walks of length n in the product graph? Right? This is a product graph. If I ask you how many walks are there of, of size 4, you need to you know, enumerate them. So there are a finite number of them, but there are many of them. And the question is, how can you do that efficiently, maybe? Um, and in particular, without, uh, you know, if you just enumerate them, it will take something to the power n. Can we do better than this? Um, and the answer is yes. So already here, there's a small trick, uh, just using matrix multiplication, right? And so here, let's let's spend a couple of, uh, I mean, some, let me explain, try to explain clearly this, uh, this trick here, which is taking some power of, of the adjacency matrix. So the adjacency matrix of a graph, it could be the product graph or any graph, uh, is just a square matrix with zeros and ones. Uh, that is, uh, you know, whose size is the number of vertices. So if you have a graph of size uh, with five vertices, the adjacency matrix is of, is of size five by five. And you put a one if and only if there is a, a, an edge between two vertices. Right? So it's just a binary matrix that describes the structure of the graph. Uh, if you call A this matrix, then something interesting is that if you take as a matrix A multiplied by itself, so A square, then you can check that the, it's not a binary matrix anymore because you may have you know one times one plus one times one. You, you may get two or three, so it's integer values. Uh, it has zeros, some ones, some twos, uh, maybe other things. But what's interesting is that what, what you can check that what it counts, so the coordinate ij of the matrix A square uh, is exactly equal to the number of walks between the, the, vertex, uh, the vertex i and the vertex j, right? Because it's a, basically to the sum of all the possible ways to go through some other vertex from i to j. And if you iterate the process, like if instead of computing A square, you compute, you multiply by A, and again by a, etc. So, if, for example, if you take the a to the power n, meaning a multiplication of the adjacency matrix by itself n times, uh, and you look at the coordinate ij of this matrix, again you can check that if uh, this would be an integer, and that the integer value at coordinate ij, so matrix a to the n coordinate ij, is exactly the number of walks that start in a and that ends in j. Right, so it's the number of walks between i and j of length n. Sorry. Right, so this is it. I mean, uh, try to think of it, convince yourself that it's true. Uh, one way to you know to do it is you expand the, the the product of matrices as a big sum. So the you know the ijs entry of a to the n is the sum over all intermediate indices of a i k times a k l times a l m etc until j. And so for this thing, all you know, all the A's, A index anything is binary. So for the product to be one, uh, you need uh, all the all the terms in the product to be ones. And so this corresponds literally to walking uh, a path. Uh, sorry, a walk in, in in a graph. Okay. So the take-home message here, the important trick is that if you just compute the matrix A multiplied by itself n times. You end up with a matrix that counts how many walks there are between each pair of vertices. And so here, remember that uh, for the for the kernel, we said that what we need to count is the number of walks of length n in the product graph, 
So the number of walks is just once you have completed A to the N is the sum of all the values in the matrix A to the N. And so you know, in matrix form, we can write it as one transpose A N times one. So it's just the sum of entries in a matrix A. All right, so, th so this gives you a formula. And interestingly, uh, you know, in order to compute uh, the product um, A to the N, uh, you, you see that uh, the size, so the, the so you have to think of what is the size of the of the matrix we consider. So here we need to take the adjacency matrix of the product graph. So there are like two steps. The first is you give me G1 and G2, then you build the adjacency matrix of the product graph, you raise it to the power n, uh, and then you, you sum the entries, and this gives you the, the, the work count. So if you're a bit careful about you know the degree because you know the degree uh, I mean a is sparse so computing the product can be fast and in fact uh, the, the each each row and column of a has at most d uh, d one times d two entries you can show that the computation uh, in that case case linear in n and not exponential All right so this is the first um, first trick now and maybe more interesting, let's look at, at the second example, which was the uh, random walk kernel or even uh, geometric walk kernel, because there, um, again, uh, we we have a formula, but we still have an infinite sum, right? Because the formula was that. So if I come back here, the formula for the, for example, random walk kernel is that the, the random walk kernel uh, is equal to the sum of all the works of the product kernel of lambda uh, g1 times g2, right? So we still need to sum over an infinite uh, number of terms. Now, we can use a trick, and I, you know, I'll go quickly through that and, and take the time to study it, which is that the lambda, uh, because we use a Markov process, so the probability of a sequence can be decomposed as a product of probabilities across the, the edges, OK? And so when you write down the, the work kernel, then uh, you can check that what we want to do is a sum over all the works of all lengths, so it's a big sum. But the lambda, the corresponding lambda is a product of lambda. Okay? And so here, if you're a bit careful, you can rewrite this as a sum of you know matrix form. So this is what we did exactly with the uh, with the random uh, so sorry, with the kernel of length n. But we still have a sum uh, of some of these from n equals zero to infinity. So we still have the problem of needing to compute an infinite sum. But here, finally, we can use a second trick, which is uh, to recognize a, a series expansion, uh, and that the sum for n equals zero to infinity of the product so of some matrix to the power n is simply the inverse of identity minus this matrix. Right, so here, this is a tree that we have seen already in standard kernels. Like, remember that to show that the exponential of a kernel is a kernel, you just rewrite it as, uh, as, as, a, as a convergent uh, series expansion. And here, we do the same with matrices. And therefore, you see that instead of summing an infinite number of terms, which is not possible, what you need to do is basically to compute a matrix, invert it. This can be done in cubic time. And multiply it on the left and on the right by some vectors. And the number you get is an infinite sum, which is exactly the walk kernel. And the same story works with the geometric, uh, geometric kernel. All right, so, as, as a conclusion, uh, the, the, the graph kernel, uh, even though it's, it's an inner product in infinite dimension and you cannot compute phi of g1 and phi of g2, you can compute their inner product uh, in, in complexity. Um, size of the product graph cubic and because the size of the product graph is uh, size of g1 times size of g2 you end up with a complexity of you know um, number of vertices to the power six so it's not excellent but at least to move from uh, np hard so uh, non-polynomial to polynomial of degree six and if you know of course if you if you want to to improve the complexity there are various tricks but here the, the main trick has been done is to convert a uh, NP-hard problem into a polynomial time uh, problem. All right, so I will, uh, I mean, this is almost almost all for today. I will just mention that in practice, so, you know, first of all, all these uh, series of work um, were done in, you know, in the years 2000 to 2010 and a bit later. So uh, 
So there's been lots of progress since then. It may be worth looking at them, but uh, even at the time, uh, you know, there were already many ideas uh, discussed to to find variants of these kernels. Uh, for example, a bit more expressive, a bit faster to compute, a bit better in some application. I'll just mention a few of them quickly, but check the slides and the references if you want to know more. Um, so one of them is the, an idea of um, uh, label enrichment, because so far I just, you know, I've been talking of, of vertices with colors, uh, blue, yellow, red, etc. If you If you talk of chemistry, you know, you could say, well, I will have, um, vertices which are at, uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. So you could do a work kernel or a random work kernel on that, but you can also decide to pre-process your data. And this, this is a bit similar, I would say, if you've heard of that, to what's done in um, graph neural networks, where instead of just looking at your original um, labels, you enrich them with the information about the neighbors, right? Uh, so you, you say that, for example, here I have just carbons, and, and I give them uh, numbers. So here the, I give number one to everybody. And then I have an iterative process. So this is something used in chemistry, in fact, a classical tool in chemistry, where iteratively you replace the number by the sum uh, of its neighbors. So for example, if you have two neighbors, you put a two. If you have three neighbors, you put a three. Uh, and you can do that uh, iteratively. So for example, uh, now instead of a three, you do two plus two plus three, so you have a seven, etc. So you see, this is very fast, very easy, but the benefit of it is that now you have new labels where suddenly, for example, a carbon that is uh, central becomes different from a carbon that is uh, uh, further away from the oxygen because one is a carbon with label seven and the other is a carbon with label four. Right, so just this simple trick is a way to enrich um, the labels you have on, on the vertices, which and, and all the kernels we have seen can handle uh, uh, the, the labels on the vertices. And so it's a way, in a sense, to, to hide or to put some, some information about the structure in the graph in the label and, and possibly to, um, to improve the, you know, the representation you get uh, once you use the new labels. Second thing, um, it's it's a small trick as well, but you know when we talk of walks, there is a problem that we can generate many walks which probably are not very interesting. Um, like for example, uh, you know when you have this graph, a blue, yellow, red, red, like uh, for for atoms, then there is a walk which is not very interesting, which is blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow. This is one of the walks, uh, but because you just Go somewhere and come back. Uh, it looks like what's called a tottering walk. Uh, when you're a bit drunk, you know, you don't walk straight, you may just totter a bit. Um, and, and you know, it can be argued that maybe these tottering walks are not very in informative. Maybe you just want uh, to remove them from the list of walks. And so this was done by, uh, you know, this was, uh, this was done um, uh, by you know, by by people who propose to say, well, when you have, uh, let's try to make a graph kernel where you just remove non-tottering walks, and it's not very complicated conceptually. You can show that in order to remove the direct tottering, so to prevent a walk from going somewhere and then directly coming back to where it was uh, from, uh, you can do that by just expanding a bit uh, your network. So it's just like a pre-processing of your graph, making it directly so that, for example, when you're at C and and so, sorry when you are in, in the edge and you move to a C, then you cannot come back to the edge because you create a new graph where when you start at H and go to a C, then you you know there are directions in the edges you can then just go to an O or to a C. Edge. Right. So mathematics is just a way to say that you create a second order Markov uh, Markov chain, uh, which says that the next position is not only dependent on the current one but also on the one just before. And this is a way to um, uh, to increase a bit the size of the, of the graph, so it's a bit longer to compute because it creates a bigger graph. Uh, but it's still a Markov walk on the on the new graph, so you can just reuse uh, the standard kernels on that graph. <coughs> a third extension um, is slightly more interesting. It's about the you know the fact that walks are nice, but are just linear features, so they, they cannot encode, for example, the branching processes or the fact that uh, here you have a node that is connected to three neighbors and not to two neighbors. So uh, 
between you know between linear walks and the full subgraph there is something intermediary which is the trees right which are um, more complex graphs but without loops and so it's possible to extend the notion of walks to the notion of subtree walks in a sense that maybe i have a picture here to say that uh, for example we can generate new graphs which are trees here by creating walks which move as before, you know, from one vertex to the next one, but sometimes, if there is a possibility, it's split in two. And so, for example, you could say that the tree, the blue tree on the right, is a sub subwalk tree uh, on the left, right? And what I mean by subwalk is that here we still uh, keep the, the the notion that it's possible to come back. For example, the green one, you see, is N N C C C, so it's linear, but it could be branching. And you see that the NNCCC requires uh, to move to the, you know, from C to C and then come back. So this is a tottering walk. But so the, the idea here is that we can create this indexing. I mean, uh, conceptually, we would like to create this indexing where we extend a bit the linear path uh, with uh, also tree shaped path uh, walks. And it turns out um, that it's possible, uh, it leads to slightly more uh, uh, complex. Um, uh, algorithms, but it's it's just uh, possible to rewrite the computation of the tree, so it's called the tree walk kernel, uh, recursively, and so so you still get a polynomial algorithm. I will not detail it here. All right, uh, maybe a last a last comment uh, is to, to make a link a bit between the the uh, you know the first extension which was labor enrichment and the last one which was to look at at um, at subtrees. Because if we come back to, you know, I said to the notion of um, uh, label enrichment, I said that the most obvious one is called the Morgan Index. So it, it started with ones everywhere and then iteratively uh, replace the value by the sum of the values of your neighbors. So you get numbers. Uh, if you think a bit about what, what these numbers represent, in fact, this number represents exactly the number of subtrees which are rooted in a given number. Right, so it's related to this mapping where, for example, from the C here, we can enumerate all the subtrees starting from C with a given uh, depth. Uh, and, and you can easily show, that it's illustrated in this picture, that, uh, for example, from this C, if you look at the subtrees of depth uh, two, you have seven of them which are rooted in C, right? So this number is, is the spirit of the recursion. Right, so, so in a sense, uh, this label enrichment here is like a cheap way uh, to summarize this feature vector, not exactly by the patterns they contain, but by how many patterns there are uh, starting at each uh, each vertex, and then using the structure of the graph to do a graph channel on, on the thing. So based on this ID, there has been some interesting work, and I think this is close to state of the art in graph channels. Uh, so one called this Vice Filer Lehman kernel which was proposed by uh, Nino Shavashidze and Carson Bogvart. Uh, uh, so based on, on some transform that, that is much older than that, uh, which basically does the same, but instead of just counting how many walks there are, uh, it, it reminds uh, the type of nodes uh, that they are, like uh, you know, uh, saying that you, are, you have a subtree uh, in a carbon, uh, such that on the left you have some oxygen and on the right some nitrogen. You want to keep that in memory. And to make this recursive, because there is a notion of how do you recursively remember what are the, the nodes, uh, the vice valor uh, Lehman uh, process amounts to iteratively not only counting, but uh, creating new labels that says, for example, here uh, on, on the top graph, you have a graph with initial labels. And on the next one, instead of just counting how many labels you have, you just list who are your neighbors. So using the labels at the first stage, like uh, you know, around the node E, you have D, B, and C. So you create a new, you, you store the information, and you give this uh, this uh, this sequence a new name, which in this case would be a, a J, right? So notice that sometimes you're gonna have the same, of course, the same label. Like A uh, connected to a D occurs twice, so you have a new node uh, A D, which is called F, and so this creates a, a new set of labels. Which are not numbers anymore, but you know, which uh, hide not only the numbers which were computed by the Borgen index, 
but as well the structure uh, or the, the, the input labels of the neighbors. And if you do that iteratively, then it's possible to enrich uh, your graph with new labels, which are much more expressive than just the numbers uh, of, the, of the Morgan index, but which are not much more complicated to compute, right? And so here, the, the labels encode not only the number of subtrees, but also the structure, uh, so number and what are the subtrees connected uh, rooted in each. Right, and, and so long story short, uh, you know, this is like a pre-processing that just starting from a graph computes new um, uh, new uh, new labels. And, and so from these labels, you know, there is so much information in the labels that maybe you just want to compare two graphs by how many times uh, each label occurs in the graph. But of course, you can as well uh, combine this pre-processing with any graph kernel, like the random walk graph, graph kernel, in order to not only to compare the presence of the different labels, but as well, uh, you know, their relative positions uh, in the graph. All right, so to conclude the session today, let me mention that um, these kernels, um, so I said, you know, in recent years, uh, there's been a lot of work as well in deep neural networks for, uh, for graphs. There is some similarity, you know, when we talk of label enrichment, etc. Basically, graph uh, conversion neural networks are also based on this notion to aggregate information, uh, you know, in a given node about the neighbors, doing that several times, and at the end to get a vector representation for for the for the graph. So it's, it's not formulated exactly the, uh, similarly, but it's uh, there, there are some similar ideas. Um, and so let me mention that uh, these. Uh, these graph kernels uh, are really used, uh, uh, you know, in chemistry, but as well as you know, any field with with graphs, it could be small graphs or even bigger graphs. Uh, and here we just mention, you know, illustrate some results. So most of them are quite old, but you know, they're still valid. Uh, so, so the first is, uh, does it work at all? Um, in fact, when I said the, the graph kernels are used, is because it turned out that they give quite interesting performance compared to different approaches, right? You, you could do completely different machine learning, like logic-based, Progol, et cetera. And there's been a series of papers in the early 2000s showing that even simple kernels could give significantly better performance than alternative approaches. So the idea to use kernel methods with graph kernels basically works well compared to doing other things. Uh, second comment is that we saw uh, several different kernels. So you may say, well, you know, does it matter at all? Should we just take the one that is faster to compute? Uh, and in fact, the reason why there has been so much activity in developing variants and different uh, kernels is that uh, at the end of the day, you have differences in computation. So I insisted a lot on that. But you also have differences in uh, performance. And so here, for example, this, this is a, a plot taken from uh, paper. I should I should add the reference. This is the paper on on subtree uh, subtree work camels. Uh, and and you know, long story short, each uh, on the horizontal axis you have a set of uh, data sets. So each one is a what's called a cancer cell line. So here the goal is to try to find drugs against cancer. Uh, we have plenty of drugs which have been tested on on individual cell lines. So these are different sub problems. Think of it as you know, one of them is, is a type of breast cancer, another one is a type of lung cancer, etc. And so the goal would be uh, to train models that that are able to predict if a small molecule uh, kills a cancer cell. Uh, so this can be formulated as a machine learning problem. Uh, vertically, you have the performance in terms of AUC, array under the rock curve. So the higher you are, the better. And here you have two curves, uh, which basically are exactly the same algorithms. Uh, the, these are support vector machines trained the same way with same way to, to optimize and the only difference is the kernel used um, Here uh, it uses a random work kernel and a subtree pattern work kernel So these are two things we mentioned and the only thing I want you to see here is that uh, Well one of them so the dotted line which is a subtree kernel is better than the work kernel uh, in all examples, right? Uh, by a couple of percent, uh, which is quite significant in that field, right? So this is just an illustration, uh, if if there was need for it, that uh, choosing a kernel. Uh, so to choose a kernel, you have to think of you know, is it can you compute it? Is it fast? 
but as well is it adapted to the problem and we see that the choice of the kernel uh, has, has a significant influence on the performance right so this is basically the, the reason why a lot of people have worked on on investigating different variants uh, this, uh, this slide uh, shows similar things. I will not spend too much time on it, but this is like a more uh, taken from a paper, uh, which uh, I think this is a paper that interests the, the, the body well, uh, kernel. So it shows that here we just have a kernel. So this is not only two kernels, but uh, seven kernels, which are compared to each other on, on three benchmarks. And again, uh, we see a significant differences. So the, you know, choosing a correct pattern uh, kernel influences the performance and, and sometimes dramatically, like here yeah, you see, for example, in, in one data set, uh, NCI, this is also uh, similar to what I, I said before, this is for screening uh, small molecules for cancer. Uh, one kernel, uh, the shortest path kernel has performance of 73%. Uh, even the graphlet count is, uh, or they say, the, the worst one. So the geometric kernel in this case, which is 58% of accuracy, and the vice mario lehmann uh, sub pre kernel, which is 82. Right? So this is a huge gap, uh, 58 to 82. This, you know, we talk of uh, important applications. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that the WL sub tree kernel is always the best. There are other cases where it's not the case, but it means that there are still, uh, you know, interesting questions which are not fully answered uh, about what is the best kernel, what kernel should you use. Uh, and, and, and so depending on the applications, uh, we may have uh, different uh, answers to that question. All right, um, maybe I can skip that. So I mean, I insisted on, on chemistry, but there are also plenty of applications, uh, especially in, in the old days on, on graph kernels, on images. And this one taken from Zaid Arshawi and Francis Black's paper, again, illustrates that uh, on an image classification task, so maybe the Test error is not uh, fantastic uh, in those days, uh, in these days, but at the time, comparing uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, I mean, four kernels plus a way to combine them that we will see in, in a few weeks, uh, we again have differences, you know, ranging from 6% error to 12% error. Almost. So you can really, um, again, choosing the right kernel matters. Okay, so that's all for today. So. You know, as, as a quick summary of what we said, we, um, you know, we spent some time trying to, to understand a bit the specificities of uh, a computational complexity of learning with graphs. We have seen that there are some fundamental difficulties in graphs, like uh, there are NP, NP complete and NP hard problems. Graph isomorphism is hard, uh, Hamiltonian path is hard, and all this complexity translates into uh, constraints on the things we can we can do on graphs like embedding a graph as a vector is hard uh, you cannot do it uh, in, in a complete way for example uh, but uh, the positive news was that at the cost of moving from subgraphs to works we're able uh, to create a nice kernel trick meaning uh, to embed to represent a graph as some infinite dimensional vector but to compute efficiently the inner product, so the, the, the kernel trick. So there is a specific kernel trick in this case for graphs uh, by uh, uh, taking the inner product in these infin infinite dimensional spaces. Okay, so we'll stop here and next time uh, we'll again talk about kernels and graphs, but next time instead of comparing two graphs, we'll just assume that we have one big graph and that we want to, uh, to to learn over the graph, so typically to make a kernel between two nodes in the graph. So see you next time.